Well, what is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at today. You made it to church, and we are so blessed you did. Well, today, as you probably heard, we are going to have an extra special guest speaker. And of course, uh, really, this guest speaker is so special that we decided to bless this person in advance by making a marquee of their name. Yes, and I know some of you are like, who is this extra special person? But, but uh, we just thought, you know what? It's Christmas time. Christmas is the time to be generous. Is it not church? Come on. And so we have some letters here. Oh, you know what? They're, they're a little off here. Um, we're going to, we, come on, Jonathan, get your people in line. Unbelievable. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, this was practiced really well. And, uh, okay, up, up, oh, up there, everybody. Oh, look at that. Yes, you're reading correctly. The special person today is named nobody else but Drew Shep. (laughs) Pastor Drew, come on up here real fast. Now... Now, for, for real, the, we actually made a marquee called Wonder for our Christmas. It was the theme of our Christmas service. And then when we realized that it also spelled Drew, I thought, you know, deep in your heart, Drew, I knew. I knew that one of your Christmas wishes from way long ago was someday to preach in front of a marquee of your name. <laughs> and, I know, and I know it technically is supposed to be Wonder, and it will be Wonder, but you know what, Drew? You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And bad jokes aside, bad jokes aside, give it up for our very own Pastor Drew Shep. Oh, I'm just going to go ahead and close in prayer, okay? We're, we're just going we're gonna, to we're gonna shut it down, call it, but hey, uh, man, so glad to be with you, Substance Man. I just love our church. I love that God has given us to each other. Um, I love that my name is behind me right now. It feels so awkward, but uh, glad you're here. Um, again, if we have not met yet, my name is Pastor Drew. So is one of our campus pastors, get to lead our downtown campus, I love our downtown campus, get to lead our interns and be one of our teaching pastors. So just, I, I love this time of the year in our church. Isn't this a fun time of the year? We, literally, we are three days away right now from the launch of our Christmas services. Can we, somebody get excited about our Christmas services? Man, if you've never been to our services, um, if you've been, you'll know we throw the biggest party of the year for Christmas. We really see this as our biggest outreach event every single year. Um, these services are like a perfect blend of old school, with candlelight singing and worship and new school with comedy. Um, Pastor Peter is going to bring an inspiring word, and I may or may not be able to tell you right now that Darth Vader himself may make an appearance in our Christmas services. I don't know. You'll just have to come and see it for yourself. But we'd love to have you come, and also we'd love to have you attend. We'd also love to have you serve. Um, Every single year, we have thousands of volunteer spots to fill at our our services. It is such a fun time to volunteer. We'll feed you a meal. Um, Actually, this is the volunteer shirt this year. You get a free shirt for volunteering, so come get hooked up with a free shirt. I mean, really, though, really the great place, if you've never even served at our church before, Christmas is a great time to actually serve for the first time. So we'd love to invite you on out. In fact, if you're even remotely interested in that uh, this weekend at our church, I want to actually text the word TEAMS to the number 31996. Again, text TEAMS to 31996. Our team will get in touch with you. We'll send you a really quick availability form. Um, Again, even remotely interested, we'd love to have you text that. And as you're doing that, I kind of want to jump into our series, right? We're in this series called Words to Live By. And over the month of December, we as a church have been reading through the book of Proverbs, right? One proverb a day, 31 proverbs, 31 days in December. It's been so fun to kind of see our people posting on social media, reading through, having Bible studies together. What a fun experience to kind of just get synced up in God's Word together. And as we've been reading through God's Word, reading through Proverbs, every single weekend then we take kind of a principle from Proverbs and talk about it in our weekend services. So... Today, I want to talk about something that I think we misunderstand a lot of the time, but to get there, I want to tell you a quick story. Now, if you've heard me preach before, you know I love talking about my kids. Um, I promise it's not that I don't have anything else to talk about, it's just that I have nothing else to talk about, <laughs> if I'm honest. Or at least that's what it feels like sometimes when you have small kids, it feels like they just kind of dominate and like run your life, you know? Um, I love my kids, they're awesome, but one of the things, um, if, you have, if you have small kids, one of the really difficult things is actually bedtime, right? Um, just imagine trying to get a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a one-year-old all to sleep all in the same night. That's intense, man. Like, I, just, I gotta start, like, gearing up for that around lunchtime, right? Around lunchtime, I'm like, okay, you can, do, you can do this, Drew. You can do this. 
your kids will go to sleep tonight. Um, no, no, everyone has like their foolproof method, don't they, of getting kids to sleep. Like some like, hey, the cry it out method. Like if you don't let your kids cry it out, it's because you hate your kids. And some people are like, well, if you do let your kids cry out, it's because you hate your kids. I'm like, I don't hate my kids. I just want to sleep. <laughs> right? like, I there's all these conflicting ideas. So if you have ideas this weekend about how to get your kids to sleep, don't send those to me, okay? Send those to jeff.zog at substancechurch.com. He would love to take all of your information and just kind of see what he does with that. So, um, but the idea here is, right, is that, man, it's hard. It's just not an easy experience to try to get your kids to sleep. And specifically, our daughter, Nora, she's now five. When she was about two or three, man, this little girl wanted no part of bedtime, right? Like literally no part of bedtime. Her version of going to sleep was laying in bed and yelling at us. Literally, she would lay in her bed for about two hours and yell things at us like, hey, daddy, I'm hungry. Daddy, I'm tired. Daddy, I'm thirsty. Daddy, I'm lonely. Daddy, I'm still not tired. Daddy, I'm still thirsty. Like over and over and over again. So one of the things I resorted to is actually, I would actually go in there and pray with her and kind of lay down with her until she was just enough asleep where I would try to sneak out, right? I would try to kind of like, I mean, I'm 6'9". I can't sneak anywhere, okay? <laughs> like, so I'm, you're kind of sneaking out. You're you know where the squeaky floorboards are? So you're looking like an idiot, just like, <laughs> wakes up, right? Or I would actually literally get down on my hands and knees, you guys, and I would crawl out of that room because I did not want her to know. because I'm 6'9". You ever seen a 6'9 guy crawl on his hands and knees out of a room? It's not pretty. I'll just leave it there. Or then, okay, you're walking out, right? You're walking, okay, she's asleep. This is awesome. I'm going to go out. I'm going to have my dinner finally, right? And then you experience the, the most difficult pain a human being can experience, the dreaded Lego on the floor. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You step on that Lego. You're trying to be quiet. You're like, ah! I mean, it's, like, it's like childbirth and then Lego on the floor, right? Like, as far as pain in this life goes, I don't know anything greater than childbirth and the Lego on the floor, right? So let's bring it back, right? So, so Nora would lay there and just yell at us over and over all these things. I'm, I'm, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm not tired. I'm sad. Leave the lights on. And finally, every night, we would kind of get down to the bottom, kind of her real motivation for not wanting to go to sleep. And what was it? She would say, Daddy, I'm scared. Fear. And fear makes us do some crazy things, doesn't it, church? If you think about it, fear is not exactly an enjoyable experience. I can't remember the last time I was terrified and thought, man, I sure do enjoy this feeling. <laughs> like, this is really, really fun right now to be absolutely scared out of my mind, right? And actually, we, we actually write books and blogs and preach sermons on how to overcome our fear, right? Fear is not an enjoyable thing. And then Substance Church decides to read Proverbs on day one, December 1st, Proverbs 1-7, we see the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. Okay, full stop. Like, fear of the Lord? What does that even mean, right? I mean, I know it sounds intense, doesn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to fear God? Like, what all that stuff about in the Bible about a loving and gracious and kind and merciful God, and now I'm supposed to fear him? Like, what does that even mean? I mean, wondering that this week as they're reading through Proverbs, it shows up over and over, actually over 300 times in the Bible, it talks about fearing God. What does it mean to fear God? And to make matters worse, many of us actually have experienced in our lives a legalistic pastor or preacher kind of take these fear of God texts and actually misuse them to kind of overemphasize the wrath of God and the anger of God and what God does to people who step out of line. And we just kind of hear this over and over again, and we hear that God is angry, and he's angry at you. And if you don't get in line, God's going to continue to be angry at you. It's kind of our way of scaring people into a relationship with Christ. Really life-giving, right? That's really helpful to be scared into a relationship with Christ. Um, or maybe for you, it was a father figure, right? For you, your, your dad or a father figure, or a leader in your life, maybe they, were, they used fear and control to manipulate you into having good behavior, right? So you walked through life really just kind of scared of what would happen next. You didn't want to step out of line because you knew what was waiting for you on the other side of that. For many of us, we have all these experiences with fear, and here's why this matters, okay? This matters because, as one of the, my favorite theologians, A.W. Tozer, says, the most important thing about you is what comes into your mind the moment you think about God. The moment you picture God, what comes into your mind about who he is, what is his nature, what is he like, how does he feel about us? Right? Because then you look in the book of 1 John, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, 1 John 4, 18 says this, it says, there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. 
And how confusing is this, honestly? Like, what a paradox. Like, isn't this just a straight contradiction? Right? I'm supposed to fear God, but hey, have no fear because his love casts out all fear. But hey, make sure you fear God. But what do we do with that? How do we reconcile this idea of fear of the Lord with a loving, caring God who wants to, you to be in his family, wants to pursue you, wants to love you, wants to bring you into himself? How do we reconcile this gap? Because that's a difficult thing, isn't it? But what if I told you this weekend that the fear of God is not what you think it is. The fear of God is not, what, you, what if I told you that God never meant for us to walk around scared or anxious or insecure, afraid that in a fit of rage he might go off and just light us up one day because we stepped out of line? That's not it at all. I believe that the word we have translated fear um, in our English language is actually less of a command and more of an invitation. It's not a command to be scared of God. It's actually inviting us into an understanding of who God truly is and actually how much he loves us, how much he wants to bless us, how much he wants us just to live in the way he has designed us to live. Because if you look at this word fear in the Hebrew language, it's actually translated, this will be kind of our working definition of fear of the Lord. Here it is, it's be on the screen. Fear of the Lord is reverence, respect, and holy awe reverence, respect, and holy awe. Let me show you what I mean, okay? In Exodus chapter 19, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. It'll be on the screen as well. But there's this really cool story in Exodus 19. What's happening here is that God is actually getting ready to give his people the Ten Commandments, right? So basically what's going on here is the people of Israel, God's people, have been in slavery for hundreds of years in Egypt, right? They've been beat down and broken up and destroyed, really, by Egyptian slavery. And now they're coming out of slavery. God is bringing them to himself. And he's trying to teach them, this is what it means to be my people, You've been slaves in a foreign land. Now come to me. I want to show you what it means to be my people. And really what he wants to do, at the end of the day, he wants to reveal himself to the world by blessing his people. He wants the world to look at his people and say, surely their God is with them. There's a better way of life. It's a more satisfying way of life. There's something about those people that is different. God wants to bless us today, I believe. He wants, us to, he wants to show us how to be his people. So God gives the Ten Commandments, um, but it's not like God shows up at the mountain with a clipboard and says, here, good luck with those, just try those out, right? Look at this. Here's what happens in verse 16 of Exodus 19. Just kind of picture this for a minute. It says, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Mount Sinai was covered in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the entire mountain trembled violently. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, and Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. I mean, how dramatic is that? It's like Stranger Things, like the original Stranger Things, right? Like, you look at that, you're like, that is so intense. I mean, talking about God coming down in a fire and smoke billowing up and thunder and lightning, like, that's scary stuff. How many of you know, if you're standing at the base of that mountain, seeing this happening, you're thinking, what is going on? And so rightly so, it says, the people were freaked. I mean, they were absolutely terrified. But in verse 20 of chapter 20, Moses makes an amazing statement. He says, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What do you mean, don't be afraid? God literally just showed up as a fire. It says in the Bible, God is an all-consuming fire. There's smoke, there's lightning. Okay, Moses, I'm afraid. Like, I give up. I'm afraid. Again, it seems like, again, a total contradiction. Don't be afraid, but this is terrifying. Fear the Lord, right? But there's no fear in love. What do we do with that? Well, I believe that if we can learn to kind of lean into this tension, right? If we can learn to kind of see what God is saying to us, it will literally completely change your and my approach to Christianity. More specifically, it will completely change our sense of motivation for living the life God has called us to right? It will change your motivation for prayer, for obedience, for everything. In fact, as we're about to find out, I believe it will supernaturally give us a resistance to sin that many of us struggle with every single day of our lives. I believe we'll learn to hear God's voice better than before. God has innumerable benefits for those who learn to properly fear him. So let's talk about that. Why do we fear God? What does it mean to fear God? Well, let's go back to um, this idea of the fire, 
right? When I was uh, a kid, probably three or four years old, um, I, me- I remember this is probably my earliest memory as a kid. Um, you'll hear, hear why in a moment here. I was standing in the kitchen with my dad, right? They were staying in the kitchen. He was giving me a pretty standard, okay, don't touch the hot stove. And you guys have been there, right? Like, don't touch the hot stove. Um, so as a three or four year old, I looked at my dad, looked at the stove, looked at my dad, and I touched the stove. Sha! Turns out my dad was right, <laughs> right? The, the hot stove, it really, really, really hurt. My dad, but who knew? My dad was right. I mean, he was actually trying to keep me from hurting myself. Right, but I, in my little three or four year old mind, I couldn't, I was, the, the boundary that had been set, I immediately wanted to test that boundary. But here's the thing, right? Stoves are good. Stoves are a good thing. You can cook some good food on that stove. It's meant to provide warmth and sustenance to us, but here's the catch. You can either fry yourself a steak on that thing or burn all the skin off your hand, <laughs> right? You can pop popcorn for your family, as Pastor Nick taught us last week, or you can burn your entire house down to the ground, right? It's a good thing. But if not used properly, right, we, har- we harm ourselves. Back to Exodus, right? So God has just given the Ten Commandments to his people. He just said, hey, man, don't be afraid. God is here. Don't be afraid. Here's what he says in verse 20. Don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will keep you from sinning. The fear of God will keep you from sinning. You see, God is like the stove right? He has created humanity. He's created us to live in a certain way that he wants to bless. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to walk with him all the days of our life. Um, But if we don't have a certain reverence or respect or awe for him and the way he's actually created us to live, we're going to burn ourselves, right? It's almost like God is saying, I mean, try it out, right? I'm going to give you these guidelines. Try it out and see what happens, so many of us are like me, right? My little three or four year old self, after receiving the warning from my father, right? I know I'm not supposed to touch the stove, but it's so red and shiny. Like, who doesn't like red and shiny things, right? Or, I mean, what if my dad is wrong? Like, what if he's actually keeping me away from the greatest thing that will ever happen to me if I touch this stove? What about that, right? Or what if I'm the exception to the rule? What if I'm the special one? Like, what if I touch the stove? Everybody else gets burned, but I get what I want. And it sounds silly, right? It sounds so silly, but for some of us, I just summed up the last couple of years of your life, right? Let's talk about generosity, right? Um, I, know, I, I, I know that living a generous life, God promises to bless me and be near to me, but I'm pretty sure that keeping my money for myself actually means I'm going to be blessed too, right? Like that, that, that's a real thing, right? Or how about sexuality, right? Does sexual purity really lead to a better way of life? What if I'm missing out on something that's really, really awesome? Like what, what if I'm the exception to the rule? What if I do this? What if I'm the special one? How about, how about um, God says, do not covet. He says, do not desire. He says, I know my soul is supposed to find rest in God alone, but what if I'm the exception and my work and my income and my title and my value can actually be found in all of these things? And I don't think any of us would say it that way, but how many of us actually live in that way, don't we? We think we're the exception. We think maybe God is actually holding out on us. Maybe he just doesn't really know. Maybe he doesn't actually have my best in mind. But you see, God's motivation in revealing himself as fire and lightning was never to show himself as angry or vindictive or vengeful. It was to show us how much he loves us and how serious sin actually is. Because you see, God is saying, look, I am holy. I am set apart. I am other. I am the creator and you are the created. I love you. You're in my image. But let's keep this thing straight here, right? He needs us to see him as holy and to approach him as holy. And remember, the reason sin is a big deal is not because it causes God to love you less or to see you differently. It's not. It doesn't cause God to change his mind about you. It doesn't cause God to second guess coming into your life and saving you. Sin is a big deal, not because it changes God, but because it changes us. The moment I give in to those desires that are outside of what God has for me, my heart begins to change. My ability to see God and experience his presence and his favor begins to decrease, and my desire for sin increases. You see that? Right? The moment I make a decision to say, I'm the exception, my ability to experience the presence and goodness and grace of God decreases. Now, his ability to give it stays the same. Like That does not change, but my ability to experience it changes, right? God wants to bless us. 
He wants to give us more of himself. He's not trying to rob us of joy. He's not trying to be a bust kill. He's trying to teach us, church, that he is actually the source of all joy. Right? He's not just, he doesn't just give joy. He is the source of it. He doesn't just give us satisfaction. He is satisfaction. He wants us to see that our souls find rest in God and God alone. So let me just say with all the love in my heart, you're not the exception. You're not. Neither am I. Right? It's not going to work for you. I'll beg you, don't burn yourself. And listen to me, right? God has way too much freedom and purpose available for us, for us to give ourselves over to these desires, right? It's not about saying, God, don't like me up. It's about saying, God, I want to follow everything you have for me. I want to trust that you are big and beautiful and worthy, and I want to have awe and respect for you. And because of that, I want to follow you all the days of my life. I trust that your plan for me is good. I trust that your plan for me is good. God is saying, just trust me. I have so much more for you, right? I have such a different perspective in you. If you would just learn to see me in my rightful place, God is saying, high and lifted up, he sees the whole picture. He wants what's best. This is the fear of the Lord. Understanding my strength, my wisdom, my ability, my giftedness, all have limits. There's limits, but God has no limits. He doesn't get tired. He's the source of all wisdom, and he is able to do exceedingly more than we could ever hope or imagine. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. God doesn't want us to be scared of him. He wants us to experience all of who he is, and to do that, we have to see him as, God, you are big. I am in awe of you, right? And really, as we think about this, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Scripture is chock full of promises for those who fear God. Look at this with me. I'm just going to kind of shotgun these at you. Um, Don't write them down, but Psalm 25, 13 and 44. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the way they should choose. The Lord confides in those who fear him. We want God to speak to you more. We want to hear from God more. The Lord speaks to those who see him with awe and reverence and holy fear. How about Psalm 33, 18? The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. He's looking at those who fear him. How about Psalm 34, verse 7? The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Right? Psalm 34, 9. Fear the Lord, you his people, for those who fear him lack nothing. In Psalm 103, 13, as a father, he has compassion on his children. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I mean, I'm telling you, this is just the tip of an amazing iceberg of God's blessing for those who fear the Lord. So we talked about what it means and why should we fear the Lord. Let's kind of end with some practical ways. How do we actually cultivate in our lives this idea of fear of the Lord? How do I actually do that? There's three things I want to get into, three practical ways to cultivate fear of the Lord. Number one is scripture meditation, right? Reading the Word of God. Pastor Peter actually preached a brilliant sermon on this two weeks ago, um, kind of walked us through how he meditates on Scripture, kind of his process. Um, if you have not listened to that, or even if you have, man, go back and give that a listen again. So incredibly practical and helpful. Um, I'm not going to get back into that, but I will say, man, write down 20 promises in the Bible that are linked to fearing God. Just 20 of them. Do a Google search, fearing the Lord. Boom. They'll pop up. Write those down. And man, for the next 30 days, just meditate on those. Just read those over, memorize them, meditate, get those down deep into you, knowing that, man, God has promises for me. I want to know what it means. God, what does this mean? Help me understand. God, that sounds awesome. What does this mean? Ask questions of God, man. Just meditate on God's word. Ask him questions about it. If you don't fully understand it, that's okay. But read it and learn it and get it down deep on the inside of you. Or one thing you could do, choose a bunch of scriptures that actually communicate how big God is. Right? One of my favorite places in Scripture is the, the book of Job. God kind of goes off on this like humble brag thing, although it's not humble because he's God. He doesn't have to be humble, right? It's like this huge, listen to this. In verse 4 in, in, a, in a chapter of Job, it says this. It says, um, God is saying this, where were you when I, God, laid the foundations of the earth? Who determined its dimensions and stretched out its surveying line? What supports the earth's foundations and who laid its cornerstone? as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst forth and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther you will come. Here your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? 
Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? And on, I mean, it's God just saying, here's who I am. Look what I have done. Look what I have seen. Look at the things I have done. I love you, but man, you got to see me in this way. I need you to see me as holy and set apart and big, right? So I, I keep going, but man, what a mighty God we serve. Like how big is our God, right? How big is our God and how great that he created us, that he loves us, that he wants to draw near to us. So number one, we, script, we meditate on scripture, memorize scripture, read scripture, get it internalized into, into our spirit. Number two, we practice small, quick obedience. We practice small, quick obedience. Now there's this experience I had, I've been married for uh, over 10 years now, my wife Erica, early on in our marriage, we'd be processing some kind of problem, right? Like, hey, what should we do about this? I'm not really sure. Um, I'd say, hey, here's what I think we should do. And I would give a brilliant answer, right? And she'd be like, I don't know. Sounds okay, I guess. I'd be like, okay, fine. <laughs> Let's pray about it, right? Uh, later that week, she would come home. She'd say, oh man, I just talked to my dad. He gave me the most brilliant solution ever to our problem. And here's what it is. And you guys, it was word for word what I had said. <laughs> word for word what I had said. I'm like, what? I was so offended, man. But here's what was going on. Here's what was going on, right? We were early on in our marriage. We were still developing trust and respect, weren't we? Like we were still developing this relationship of saying, I kind of know what I'm talking about. You kind of know what you're talking about. Let's, let's honor and respect each other. She had in her mind, her dad was like the guy who knew it all, right? Because the truth is, we listen to the people that we assign the most respect to, don't we? We listen to the people we see with, as with the most wisdom, with the most honor, and with the most respect in our lives, right? And how much more does God deserve our full honor, our full respect, our full obedience, right? We listen to the voices, we respect, and here's the rub. I've come across so many people in my ministry, and I'm guilty of this too, who are asking God like massive questions about their lives, right? Who am I going to marry? What job am I going to have? Where, gonna, where am I going to be in 10 years? What house should I buy? Really good questions to ask, aren't they? Like those are really good questions to ask. At the same time, I've seen so many people so totally ignore the small steps of obedience he's called them to. God, where am I, who am I going to marry? And God is saying, no, 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 take the first step of getting your sexual purity in line, and then we'll talk. Or God, what house am I going to buy? Like, I want the promotion. God is saying, great, I want to give you the promotion. Take the first step. Get a budget, bro. Like, just take the step. Take the next step God has called us into. Because here's the deal. This is what maturity in Christ actually looks like. It actually looks like it's not how much I know, it's how quickly I can obey my conscience. It's not how much I know. It's not how much Bible. And Bible knowledge is awesome. I love the Bible. Maturity in Christ is not Bible. It's saying, no, I want to respond to the voice of God because I have assigned him a level of respect and awe and wonder that I know every step he calls me into is for my good. Every step he calls me into is some way, shape, or form shaping me for his destiny for my life. I don't have to mistrust. I don't have to think that God is misusing me in some way because here's the deal. God wants to bless you, but he more wants you to be a man or woman of character. Because you don't want the blessing of God without the character to sustain it. Otherwise, it will become a curse in your life, I promise you. The blessing of God comes to those with the soul, the structural integrity of their souls and hearts to withstand it. So every step God calls you into, he's getting you further and further and closer and closer. If we just learn to see him, man, he's got a different perspective than I do. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. So I trust that every small, insignificant step is getting me there. I'm gonna get there because God will not let me not get there. That was a double negative. God is going to get me there. Man, if I just learn to see him and trust him and respect him, right? Don't underestimate what God can do with a lifetime of small, faithful, quick obedience. 30 years of one step and one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, I dare you, man, watch what God does. Like, watch what he will do with a lifetime of faithful obedience, right? Okay, so number one, scripture meditation. Number two, practice small, quick obedience. And number three, man, plant yourself in the church. If you want to see the fear of God come to, act, come to be active in your life, plant yourself in the church. Because here's why. Fear of the Lord cannot be taught. It has to be caught. Like, I can't just tell you, hey, have more reverence for God. Okay, now go do it. 
or just have more respect for God, now go do it. But when we gather in a room on a Sunday, and we, as, as the people of God, gather in a room and worship is happening, I experience the bigness of God, don't you? Like when we're worshiping and there's music and we're singing to God, when we're hearing the word of God taught and preached, when we're engaging in the foyer, when I'm in a small group and I have a front row seat to watching God literally change somebody's life, God gets a lot bigger to me. When I have a front row seat to literally watching somebody go from death into life and watch God give them the blessing of his presence and the blessing of who he is, I watch God get bigger in my own vision. It's not about, God doesn't get bigger, we start to see him as bigger. That's why we say, man, get in a small group, join a team. It's not because we desperately need those positions. We do, right? But it's because we experience the reverence and awe and wonder of God when we're in those places together. When we're in church together, when we're in groups together, when we're serving in teams together, we see who God is. I mean, that's why we're having nine Christmas services. It's not so we can burn ourselves out. We want to create every opportunity for people in this city to experience God. Right? We want to have people in this room. Why do we just believe that God loves these cities way more than we do? I'm just trying to keep up with God, right? I'm just trying to keep up with his heart for these cities. I believe that God wants people to experience him, to see him as big and holy. That's why we're doing these, man. So I, I just want to invite you. I guarantee you, you have people in your life that need the fear of the Lord in their life. You have people in your life that need to see God as worthy of our respect and worthy of our awe and worthy of our wonder. That's our whole thing of Christmas. It's wonder. Man, let's just recapture the wonder of who God is. Right? I love that God draws near and he's close to us and he loves us and he comes near and he wants to in- intimately involve with our lives. And man, we learn to see him as big. Jesus be big in our church. So scripture meditation, Right? Practice small, quick obedience and plant yourself in the church. And you kind of end, I want to tell you a story. Several years ago, I was discipling a young college-age Christian, an awesome young man, so much potential, so much charisma. He was just a gifted, skilled, popular on his college campus, an amazing young guy. Um, This young guy, this poor dude, was wound so tight when it came to his relationship with God, right? He was wound so tight, he would be asking questions. It would start with, you know, God, what classes should I take? And God, who should I date? And God, what job should I apply for? Really good questions, right? But what happened with this young man is his motivation was out of a fear of punishment. Man, if I make the wrong choice, God is going to punish me, right? If I don't do the right thing, God is going to light me up. He's going to be angry with me. He's going to be impatient with me. He's going to be ungracious with me, right? And so literally, he was absolutely terrified of doing the wrong thing. When it came down to it, at the end of the day, he was paralyzed, I mean, he would literally sit in his dorm room. Man, what, what color cup should I use today, God? Okay, the re- okay, what shirt should I wear today? And he was literally paralyzed. Every sing- he couldn't take a step, right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't ask God for guidance because we should, right? God wants to guide us. What I'm saying is the motivation is not being scared, but it's wonder. God, I know the next step you're calling me into is a good step. It's for good for my family. It's good for me, it's good for my kids, and it's good for you. And even if it's a hard step, even if it leads to difficulty or pain, I'm going to still take that step because I trust you. I know that you see the full picture that I don't see. So I trust you. So I want to bring it back to even this idea that we started with. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. So church, if you're in, in church this weekend, if you're sitting here saying, man, I'm not even sure what I believe about God. Okay, this whole fear of the Lord thing, it kind of makes sense, but I don't know if I even believe in Jesus. Man, we're so glad you're in our family this weekend. I mean, we're so glad you're here. Here's what you need to know. God is not in love with the future version of you. He's not. The next step you take will not cause God to love you less or to love you more, right? God wants you to fear him because he is worthy of respect and honor, but he loves you. And we as the followers of God live in this tension. We walk it out together There is nothing in your life, no person, no circumstance, no nothing that has the authority or the ability to remove God's loving presence from your life. Every day we make choices. Let's fear the Lord together, church. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are big. Thank you that you've revealed yourself as big and holy, as the creator of all things. And thank you that in your bigness and in your wonder and your majesty, you created us, your people, in your image. Thank you that you want to draw near to us, 
Thank you that as we take steps towards you, you will bless us with your presence. You will thrive us in our lives. Even in the hard things, God, we want to trust you. So church, if you're here this weekend, maybe you haven't given your life to Christ before, maybe you're not even sure, I would love just to invite you into a prayer of surrender. We're going to pray this together. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for creating everything. Thank you for creating me. And thank you for coming for me. Thank you for saving me. I surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And church, if you did pray that prayer this weekend, we would love to have you just text the word substance to 31996. That's our way to kind of get in touch with you. We as pastors, we love to journey with people. We love to hear your story, to pray for you. So if you would text substance to 31996, um, we'd love to uh, start the journey with you. And with that, I want to invite our campus pastor to come on up and tell us we're going to next. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching this message from Substance Church. If Substance is your home or you want to partner with us to support the work that God is doing through this ministry, then you can take advantage of our online giving option. Just go to substancechurch.com and click on the Give Now tab in the upper right hand corner. This is a quick and simple way to support all that we're doing here. God bless and we'll see you next week.